I'm at Swindon Station and I'm about to catch a very special train. It's just about six o'clock in the morning and the train I'm about to catch has been around for 43 years in frontline service but is now about to retire. We've known it as the high-speed train, the HST or the Intercity 125 but today it's the Flying Banana. snaking its way under the wires and past Swindon's former railway works, the Great Western's final full-size HST, the charity special, the Flying Banana. Having already seen the end of regular departures from London Paddington, this was to be a memorable trip, raising money for charity, and it proved to be just that. Looking back, I remember only too well when Swindon was the home of British Rail Engineering Limited for the Western Region. The once famous railway works witnessed the introduction of the Intercity 125 back in 1976 in their striking blue and yellow livery. Of course the rail works closed in 1986 and the corporate colours of British Rail have long since disappeared. Privatisation saw the creation of Great Western and another set of colours took to the rails. Since then we've all become familiar with the blue dynamic lines livery. And across the years, high speed trains have been consistent in transporting millions of people on one incredible journey. I personally will never forget the hiss of air from the suspension or the smell of burning brake blocks. We once loathed their introduction, and now we mourn their demise from frontline service. The shell of the once proud GWR works stands in silence, saluting the age of the train before the new order took over. And so our journey begins like so many others before, on the platforms at Temple Meads in Bristol. The sun still rising on the first day of June as the flying banana sets off into history. For me, like so many others, this was to be one incredibly memorable day, extremely poignant and sad. It's a credit to all the rail enthusiasts that the journey has been recorded through incredible images and video. And I would personally like to thank everyone for allowing me the generous opportunity to share their work here as part of this programme. Next stop Bath and one of the most iconic settings on the Great Western Railway, the Sydney Gardens. And now arriving into Swindon, the sun shining, our two power cars for the day, 43002, named after the HST designer Sir Kenneth Grange, and 43198, specially named after two drivers that lost their lives in tragic accidents on the Great Western. Today was split into three separate journeys, and this was the first leg, Bristol Temple Meads to London Paddington. A sprint up the main line into the capital, and credit must be given to Great Western for the superb effort in running this train. 
special carriage labels created and placed on every seat for the travelling guests, and each seat also carrying a unique reservation ticket. The overhead electrification equipment is clearly visible here, and this is where the new Elizabeth line reaches the surface after travelling under London. So, just after 7am and in glorious sunshine, the train is on the approach into the London terminus at Paddington for the first visit of the day. The once massive parcel depot at Paddington now long gone, replaced by towering apartments, setting the scene for today's modern railway. It's a far cry from the days of the halls, castles and kings, long gone of the westerns and hydraulics, and now we celebrate the retirement of the 125. On time and with the previous evening's sleeper stock still in Platform 1 at Paddington, the first leg of the Flying Banana is complete. So, first part of the tour over, we've just arrived under the wonderful, magnificent Paddington Station. Next stop, Carmarthen. A scene we've all taken for granted for so long, under the magnificent glass roof at Paddington, a waiting rake of Mark III coaches, a power car at each end, ready to whisk people away to all points west. A scene that was to be repeated throughout the day, these workhorses being treated like celebrities, with thousands of photos and numerous videos, recording their last full day on the main line. This retro blue and yellow power car enjoying its last day in public service, earning its place as part of the National Collection based at the Railway Museum in York. But for today, it's one of the stars of the show. Well, there are very few celebrities in the railway world, but this is one of them. Power car 43002, named after its designer Sir Kenneth Grange. And so, preparations taking place for a 7.30 departure and the second leg of a flying banana tour. A sprint from London Paddington down the western main line, turning off at Dickcock, up towards Oxford, across to Hereford and down to Newport and ultimately on to Carmarthen. And what a departure! The crews operating the train making sure we would never forget the sight of a full-size HST leaving London Paddington.
my view from the train and we see us passing the former London home of the Westerns HST Depot, Old Oak Common, famous in railway circles since the age of steam. The former servicing depot for the HSTs already having been raised to the ground to make way for a new development and a new chapter in the history of Old Oak. And then into the station that's probably undergone one of the most dramatic changes of all during the lifetime of the HST, the modern surroundings of Reading. The 125, like the old GWR station, being swept away in the name of progress, now that electrification here is complete. For many of us, we knew this was likely to be the last time we might ever travel on a high-speed train on the Great Western. It's a view we've all seen so many times, the train manager preparing to unlock the doors as we arrive into Oxford. It's a sight we all take for granted, but in this modern age of safety-conscious travel, a necessary one. It does make you wonder how we managed for so many years to open the doors ourselves without someone else having to lock and unlock them. So we've just arrived in Oxford, we've travelled down the main line. This is the old haunts of the HST and there really is an atmosphere developing on board. It's a very poignant train, this one. People know this is the last high-speed train working across the Great Western network. Can you close it for me? Okay, going. Our journey continues across Oxfordshire and into Gloucestershire, and what some stunning views of this history-making train. And on board, another view that was about to disappear forever. There's been much debate about the demise of the buffet car. Surely one of the delights of rail travel has been being able to stand up and wander along to buy a drink or a snack, or even a hot meal, or perhaps one of British Rail's famous sandwiches. With the withdrawal of the HST comes the withdrawal of the buffet. However, on this service, it proved to be as popular as ever and a great focal point for meeting fellow enthusiasts enjoying the day out on this special day in history. It's one of the memorable highlights I have of the day, the proud sound of the two-tone and every opportunity, and quite rightly so. And approaching Worcester Shrub Hill, the opportunity to see this classic train under some classic signalling 
in view of the famous cathedral. A brief pause and we set off under the semaphores and head towards Hereford on a route which until recently was old stomping ground for these workhorses. And you'll notice wherever there was a station there were people, wherever there were people there were cameras and wherever there were cameras it was an opportunity to sound the horn. Whilst I was happy to sit back and take in the scenery and the occasion there were many that wanted to celebrate the occasion with a souvenir. On board the opportunity to buy some unique souvenirs as well, some wonderful prints of the HST in action at Coglow Junction from Richard at 360 Railways or perhaps some much coveted carriage destination labels from the final services to go alongside that of the flying banana. And by this time, having been caught behind an earlier delayed train, we're running behind time. Not that many people on board worried too much about that. And we cross from England into Wales as our journey towards Carmarthen pushes ever onwards. We round the curve at Mainly Junction, Newport. And then, shortly after, arrive in the Welsh capital of Cardiff. Of course, for many years, Swansea and Cardiff have been journey's end on services from London for the high-speed fleet. Flying Banana is certainly living up to its name. We were 20 odd minutes late. We've now recovered all that time, still heading for Carmarthen. As I say, living up to its name, the Flying Banana. After the briefest of pauses, we push on further westwards into Wales, the nose pointing towards Swansea. <laughs> 
just before Swansea, we turn off the main line and pass the recently closed Landor Depot. This was the Welsh home of the high-speed train, and already the rails are covered in rust and weeds peeping up through the gravel. By this time we knew the race was on to reach Carmarthen, in time to turn the train around and head back. Schedules were tight and there was very little layover time. Passing Llanelli, another reminder of the 1970s, the British Rail Double Arrow logo, still used as a sign of the British Railway Station. And then the scenery opens up to reveal the Locher estuary, where the River Locher enters the sea at Kevin Patrick Bay at Pull, a clue that our destination isn't too far away. Although we're all keen fans of travelling by train, we're also keen to get off, stretch our legs and take a few snaps. So just over six and a quarter hours from London Paddington, we've arrived in Carmarthen, having travelled down via Oxford and Hereford, just five minutes layover here before we dash back to Paddington, this time via Seven Tunnel Junction. We'll be going up through Gloucester, through Swindon, and again into the capital. And once again, it's a great credit to all the team involved. They allowed everybody a few precious minutes to take those all-important pictures at our destination before we piled back on and headed back to London. An opportunity to even capture a few snaps of the crew that made this all possible. So we head back and this time we call in to reverse the train at Swansea. Well, this train really is living up to its name, it's been non-stop, we've been into Carmarthen, we've now just arrived at Swansea, time to change ends, we've got about 10 minutes, everybody as you can see is dashing off to take photos whilst the train takes on some much needed water for that dash back to Paddington. A chance here to remember a couple of drivers who were tragically killed in railway accidents. Driver Stan Martin killed in the accident at Ufton Nervet. And on the other side of the same power car is the name Brian Cooper, remembered as the HST driver tragically killed in the accident at Labrook Grove just outside Paddington. A fitting tribute to Adorn 43198 on this epic journey. We earlier saw the closed depot at Landor, and here, as we depart Swansea, its replacement, the new Hitachi servicing depot for the Intercity Express train, the replacement of the HSTs, still awaiting overhead line equipment, which seems unlikely to ever reach Swansea. And once again I pass on my thanks to those who took the time and the effort to record the passing of our train in a whole range of locations across the west of England and Wales right up into London. Without them I wouldn't have been able to put this programme together. Climbing the bank into Cardiff, once again Sir Kenneth is leading our train as we pull into Cardiff Central.
Well, we were here just over three and a half hours ago, and here we are again. The Flying Banana is back in the capital of Wales. We are in Cardiff, and uh, the train has turned around at Swansea, so the power car, the famous power car, is at the front once more. We're on the dash up to London Paddington via Seven Tunnel Junction, Gloucester and Swindon. We now pick the train up travelling up the banks of the River Severn between Newport and Gloucester. Such glorious views. And then into Gloucester, before turning towards Swindon up the Golden Valley for a real treat up to Sapperton Tunnel. Well, it's rather poignant and sad for me. We're about to approach Swindon, just a few miles away. After 43 years of travelling on the high-speed train, it's all come to an end. But what a journey it's been. It's been a fantastic time and some great memories. Remembering some of the early days of travelling on the high-speed train, trips between Swindon and Cheltenham, old haunts, great memories. But all things change, and in fact this section of lines now being redoubled once more, essential during some of the huge engineering work that's been undertaken for electrification. And once more past the offices of the old GWR Railway Works in Swindon, on the line known as the Kemble Branch. These same offices where those once famous steam trains were designed and then built by the men of the GWR. The familiar squeal of the Mark III coaches turning one by one towards the London to Bristol main line. And in the opposite platform, one of the new trains, already nicknamed the Flying Cucumbers. So for me, this is the spiritual home of the Great Western Railway here in Swindon. After 43 years, this is the last time the high-speed train will be passing through the station. It really is a memorable occasion and it's one that we've all enjoyed aboard the Flying Banana. We're now on this final leg of the London to Carmarthen and back to London flying banana trip. A spirited run in glorious sunshine, making for some fantastic scenes.
Well, here we are arriving back at London Paddington. It's almost half past six. There's a short break here for 25 minutes before we do that dash down to Plymouth. It really has been non-stop, but what a great crowd on board the train. And thanks to everybody who's made it possible. A very memorable day. And at Paddington, scenes of celebration. Well, after a truly epic journey, here we are at London Paddington for what could be the very last time ever that we see one of the high-speed trains in this huge station. It's been quite a journey, 43 years. They were supposed to be just a stopgap until the electrics arrived. That's what it's taken, 43 years, and now they're retiring from frontline service. And for many people like me, it's a tad emotional. We'll be losing these truly iconic trains. It's a name, iconic, that's been used all over the place recently, but it surely is none truer than this. The saviour of British Rail, introduced back in 1976. The high-speed train, the 125, the journey shrinker, and today, quite rightly, earning the title, the flying banana. Now facing towards Plymouth, power car 43198 and one of the drivers preparing to make his final run before he retires. A celebratory cake in hand. So this could be it. The very last time that we ever see a high-speed train here at London Paddington. I have to say, myself, like many other people, find this a very emotional occasion. Intercity 125s, the HST, thank you for 43 fabulous years. This was the end, the final time that we'd expect to see a high-speed train at Paddington. And what a departure. There are simply no words.
By this time, 43002 was showing signs of exhaustion. Problems with the alternator causing a loss of power. But undeterred, we continue west. And for one final time, we reach the coast and a dart along the famous South Devon seawall to Dawlish, on to Tynmouth, and of course, on to Plymouth. It's just after 10 o'clock at night and the flying banana has arrived here in Plymouth. And with it comes to the end, the full-size HSTs on the Western region. It's been one heck of a journey Thank you for 43 glorious HST years. And then, all too soon, it was over. The final trip on the final day with the final full-size HST. As you might expect, everybody wanted one last picture and wanted to be in that cab. And for me, these are pictures I'll treasure. It will remind me of a special day, the flying banana, a special train and a great effort by GWR to mark the end of the Intercity 125. So from me, a few final thoughts. It is quite an emotional time. I've grown up watching these trains ever since my nan used to take me to the station in Swindon. When they were introduced in 1976, I remember thinking how exciting they were, the shape, the colour, the noise, and certainly the speed. And then as I got older, they changed liveries. They've always been around. Whenever I've gone to work, when I've wanted to travel for pleasure, it's usually been a high-speed train from Swindon that I've caught. So I, for one, will miss them. And I hope you'll agree that they have had a fantastic career and I will have very many happy memories that I will never forget of a high-speed train. Only now is the reality sinking in. The end for these trains operating at full speed in frontline services day in, day out across the Western region. And as many will point out, they still continue with other operators in other parts of the country. But for us, here in the West Country, it will never be quite the same.
and once again I'd like to pass on my sincere thanks to everyone who's generously allowed me to use their extraordinary footage charting the progress of this special train, the Flying Banana.